Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. I had a specific moment where I was photographing this girl and I, I don't know about you, but I learned um, at my family's hunters and I learned how to shoot a camera simultaneously with a gun. And so there's a, a hmm. there's a similarity of getting really slow, lowering your breath. And I started shooting with film and long lenses and film and it's holding things steady and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I hold my breath when I shoot, which is a terrible habit, but it keeps the camera super steady and it can keep it uh, open, the aperture open a little bit more. When I do this, I completely zone out what is around me with the scent, with the sound, everything. And I just zone in on the optical, like the one dimensional, what's, how is this going to look in a one dimension? Not this experience that I'm having at this Playboy party, like right here without everything else, what is going to be seen here? And I just saw a flash of trauma in this girl's eyes. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have Emily Goudreau on the show today. And uh, what a super interesting headline when I came across <laughs> you for the first time. Uh, when you hear, you know, former Playboy photographer and now, you know, advocating against, you know, the danger of pornography, kind of pornified culture, those two things don't really go together. So it seems like there's a lot of, uh, a lot of area to cover in between, but uh, can you just tell me just a little bit before we get into that, even what your background is, how you kind of started your career and uh, how you ended up kind of traveling and, and working. Okay. So um, hello everybody. And the background, I mean, the, the playboy story um which is like the meat of it. Everybody wants to know that. But I used to be a commercial photographer, advertising, editorial. Um, I worked for Rachel Ray. I did work for Bill Gates. Um, and I, you know, I went to art school in the UK. I ran away, um, like literally ran away and went to the UK and ended up going to school there. And being a photographer was a good way to travel. Totally worked. Nice. And uh, 2008 hit and I, uh, all the ad agencies were hitting a wall with their money and their mm. budgets and playboy called me up saying that they had a gig in Albuquerque. So they flew me out and I was like, heck yeah. Like this is <laughs> playboy. I, you know, at that point I was just anybody with a big name, you know, I was con- right. creating this, like what I thought was this awesome resume of, you know, big players and playboy is a big one. And to have them call you, Um, out of the blue, I've never, I never put a bid on a job or anything Mm. like that. Um, and to do, to shoot an event. And it was, it was actually, uh, a really interesting photo shoot because two things happened. One, it pretty much ended my career. Um, Mm. and I'll go into that in just a little bit. And then two, the people that worked with Playboy, it's very clear that they are very, Um, And I don't speak positively about anybody that produces porn very often, but Playboy does a very good job of hiring people who are um, probably some of the nicest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And it was odd because I wish I had met people like that before at the beginning of my career. You know, photographers are like chefs. It's like we're standing on ladders with megaphones yelling at people about lighting. Um, And these guys weren't like that. It was obviously, it's obvious that, that they pick, they're very selective of who they bring in to work. Um, and then, um, yeah, I had, I had a, a moment where I realized that these girls, I, I had kind of bought into this idea that sex workers were there by choice most of the time. Um, 
And especially at Playboy, you know, that they were making money and using their body how they wanted to. And that was their right. Like, I don't care. You do your work. I'll do mine. I've got no problem with that. And that's not what I saw in those girls. Right. It was different. Um, it wasn't, um, it wasn't this, you know, I've been to burlesque shows, obviously, and that kind of thing where it's just like this body love. And, um, that's not what was happening. It was, it was hard. It's hard to say what it was, but something definitely wasn't right. And I went home and I put my camera away and I never photographed anything again. Hmm. Even, even my Instagram, even taking crappy foam photos. Oh my gosh. So, well, so, <laughs> so I got right <laughs> it like, eh, it makes me sick to my stomach. Right. So, uh, I mean, I have to ask, I definitely want to dive into that a little bit more and kind of what it was you felt or saw. Um, Cause I know there was a, an exact moment that kind of triggered yeah. that, but, but um, just backing up and partially just kind of interested. And in, I, I share some of that of, you know, traveling and photography and, and video background. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, you do video too. Right. So um, one, I'm just curious, like, and I am going somewhere with this, but I also want to know, like you traveled around like Africa, you were in the UK. What were some of the places that you were, you actually went to and what kind of photography you're doing? Was it a lot of like ad stuff or was it more just journalistic? It was, you know? it was journalistic and it was basically, so it was right after nine 11 and I went wherever there was a, what is it? The, where the U S says, don't go there. That's where we would go. If the U.S. put a ban on going there. So we were in, uh, I went into Nepal during, um, they had like the, the Nepalese government and the Maoists, there was the civil war there. So I went to Nepal and photographed that. Um, and I went to Muslim East Africa right after 9-11 and to Zanzibar and kind of photographed the celebration, basically, that mm-hmm. they were celebrating the Twin Towers going down and um, yeah. And then I tried to sell my photos. Right. I was shooting film. <laughs> right. That's the days of film, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I was being sent out to go photograph atrocities. Yeah. And I hit, I hit a wall and, um, I was like, I can't, you know what it was. I'll be honest with you. It was one specific time and it stopped the documentary work. Um, I was in Nairobi and I was asked, to get, if it was, I don't even remember who, what station or where I was like trying in contact with whoever associated press, whatever. And they said, get photos of um, the riots that are going on down there. And there were no riots. No, There was like stories of Americans being drugged by trucks and all this kind of stuff. And um, I actually, I said, well, there was this comedy show where this black guy had his, obviously he was like Kenyan and he had a white face. And he was pretending to be a stupid white person. Yeah. And um, so it was a crowd in the street and they were all cheering and, you know, jumping up and down. And they said, well, send us one of those. That'll work. And Hmm. I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. This is not what I signed up for. It was people having fun, laughing. And we're going to submit that as a riot against Americans. Right. Like not just hard, just totally broke my heart, honestly. Right. And then that's when I went into the commercial work where I was like, you're going to stand here and you're going to smile yeah. and more uh, control a little yeah. bit of what you're doing. Yeah. It's like, I call it hunting versus gathering. I'm going right. to gather this scene as opposed to hunt it down. And yeah. you only really get paid for atrocities with editorial work. So, right. Yeah. No, I come from kind of a nonprofit background and that was kind of one of the things that I just personally set up pretty early on. And the guys I worked with were in this mindset as well. But I just said, like, I don't want to just take pictures of, you know, the naked kid bathing in the gutters. Like I want to show the kids smiling and like living life. And, and if someone was going to come here and take a picture of me and my family, even if we are in the poorest of situations, like how do we want to be represented? Um, And yeah, it's, it's something that I think, um, you know, I, I speak, you know, of American photographers. I think a lot of times, even organizations that are trying to do good stuff, they look for, you know, what 
what you could call like poverty porn. Like what's the worst thing Thank we can you. show? Oh my gosh. You yes. Know? And so many times people are like, Oh, I want that picture. I want to have it on my wall. I'm like, you don't know them. Right. That's weird. Yeah. Like, yeah. This, like this old person in Cambodia, you want a picture of them on your wall. Right. That's weird. That's super weird. Like, yeah. you know, in a magazine, I mean, that's a little bit better, but as for that part of it, I just couldn't, I couldn't get around that either. And that's why I was like, like hunt, like going out and photographing homeless people and strangers. Yeah. And it's a weird gray area of like yeah, kind of moral gotta, gray area. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I was just, I was curious to get some more background on that. Cause you touched on it in a couple of interviews I've listened to, but I was curious where all you had been. Um, I've been to Rwanda. So that's the uh, only Ooh, part of yeah. East Africa I've been to beautiful, like honestly, beautiful country. Yeah. And because of photographs I'd seen from there, I was like, not looking forward to going. I was like, sc- I was like, is it going to be scary? Is it going to be like, and super beautiful place, super kind people and just a really cool experience. But. I had the same, uh, situation in Uganda. Hmm. lush beautiful we you yeah. know we saw the mountain gorillas and um just wonderful people and it was amazing just, yeah but i was so flipping scared right <laughs> <laughs> it was like we're gonna get beheaded at the edge of the congo or something but. sure um so so transitioning into commercial i mean uh, the reason i asked a little bit of that and one just because i want to know i like travel stories but also i'm curious um you know, you'd mentioned you had been photographing atrocities and even though, you know, there were some things that, you know, were embellished by the news media here, you were still seeing people in extreme poverty. You're going to places where you're seeing the effects of these, you know, civil wars or these, you know, this unrest, like you're looking at some pretty legitimately uh, bad stuff. And um, I know a lot of people burn out on that. Um, But one thing you, one thing you mentioned uh, on one of your interviews was you had talked about that kind of separation that photographers have when they're taking a picture like you. And I say the same thing with doing interviews. Like if, if I sat across from someone in the cafe and heard their, their story of abuse, I, my personality is I would be crying with them. Like that's how I am. But when I get behind a microphone and you have zoom yeah. or a computer out, it's easier to kind of set that emotion aside and focus on interviewing or, or getting the information that you need. Um, but there was something that happened. So outside of all these you know, atrocities that you're looking at going into the corporate world, you're in a controlled environment at a playboy party, which you've kind of said is, is as the classier side of that industry. Right. Yeah. um, And, and pretty controlled. Um, But you saw something where that emotional side slipped in a little bit. Can you just talk about that, that moment and that photograph that kind of, you know, changed your perspective a little bit? Yeah. So we were, um, I mean, gosh, I mean, it was basically shooting a party. Right. Um, and I had, I had a specific moment where I was photographing this girl and I, I don't know about you, but I learned um, at my family's hunters and I learned how to shoot a camera simultaneously with a gun. And so there's a, a hmm. there's a similarity of getting really slow, lowering your breath. And I started shooting with film and long lenses of film and it's holding things steady and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I hold my breath when I shoot, which is a terrible habit, but it keeps the camera super steady and it can keep it uh, open, the aperture open a little bit more. Um, and when I do this, I completely zone out what is around me with the sense, with the sound, everything. And I just zone in on the optical, like the one dimensional, what's, how is this going to look in one dimension? Not this experience that I'm having at this playboy party, like right here without everything else, what is going to be seen here? And I just saw a flash of trauma in this girl's eyes. And it's one of those things where, you know, as, as a photographer, you're photographing my like one sixtieth of a second pieces of time. And I caught it. I caught that look in her eye and it was different. It was different than what she was putting on. It was different than what she was trying to display. It was like the core of her flashed for a minute. Like she let her guard down for a half a second I'm not a half a second, a 60th of a second. And I got it and I edited the images and I saw it and it just made me sick. Not her, but just, I felt, I felt whatever was going on with her. I felt it. And it's not like, you know, 
to be, everybody's got this fantasy of what like the Playboy stuff is like. It is a very controlled environment, yeah. Especially these parties, and um, the, they're in like their bunny suits. It's basically like a one piece swimsuit, right? Right. I mean, it's as it's a hundred percent more conservative than a beach. Hmm. Um, so it's not like she was like stripping and doing something way out of her comfort zone, but there was trauma there. And later I learned, uh, I mean, years later, I learned that it's like 90% of sex workers, which I, that's definitely sex work, um, were sexually abused as kids. Hmm. And now that I've been doing this work, I mean, maybe, maybe you can as well. Once you see it a few times, I can spot trauma in somebody a, mo- a mile away. Hmm. You can just, it's like this bad, like the, not everybody depends on if they, they've dealt with it, but um, yeah. So I just saw her trauma and that was the first time probably in my life where I was like, I'm causing this. Hmm. I'm participating in this. I'm, I'm adding these little blocks and I'm making money off of the fact that this person was traumatized enough to make her feel like her body was public property. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think what's interesting about that is like prior to that, your, you know, cause I think sometimes people hearing this and this is, this is something where even my audience, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand, even my audience, I think there's different views on, you know, this industry, there's different views yeah. on, you know, there's some people who would say like, you know, it's pure liberation. Like it's, it's a positive thing. Um, but you kind of came at it from that angle and up to that moment, would have been on board with saying that you would have said like, yeah, this is awesome. It's, you know, women's liberation and, you know, uh, fill in the blank. And in that moment, even though you may not have at the moment identified what it was, you felt something that made you feel like off or that something was wrong. Yeah. Um, Somebody was hurt. Right. How, what did that prompt you to do? Cause you said you went home, you kind of quit the industry right then and there, but what was it that made you start investigating like what caused that feeling? When, when did you start looking at, you know, statistics and, and start diving into this? Honestly, it wasn't at my daughter. And I had had a few people in my life tell me things that had happened. And, you know, and then I started having, you know, when you have kids, this weird thing happens where suddenly things you never questioned before, like start coming back and, you know, my best friend in grade school was sexually abused by her mother. I had complete and completely forgotten about that. It, it wasn't even, wasn't part of my collective conscious until I had my daughter. And I was like, whoa, you yeah. know, her mom would do stuff to her and tell her that it was um, because she was so mature. And then my friend would tell me, and I'm like, I don't like, gosh, my, nobody does that to me. And she's like, yeah, that's because you're not mature enough. You know, and I thought oh, like, oh, I'm like this nerdy hey. kid that, nobody's doing these things to me. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I was being groomed Hmm. through, through this, my friend who was being groomed. No. And then with the stuff online and um, somebody I knew their daughter had contacted a pedophile and was expected to meet up with him. Hmm. And it was, you know, just stuff like that where I'm like, Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? This is, this is scary. Right. And, um, I did, I had kind of a, a God moment where I was, I was sitting, I was sitting in the bathtub and I was like trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I have a daughter. I had some health issues and, um, like I needed to have a career or, you know, what, what am I going to do? I have, I have, energy in life. And I want to do something. And God was, it was mostly around sex trafficking. I got this message to do something around sex trafficking. And I just said, no, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Like of all people, you know, I worked for Playboy, you know, my views on that stuff are pretty loose. No. And it just kept coming back and coming back. And that's when I was like, all right, Hmm. here we go. And then once I started looking into it, it is it's unbelievable. And it's the, honestly, the stuff online right now is what scares me more than anything. Right. The um, pornography. Right. Yeah. It's definitely, I mean, even looking back to 2008, you know what I mean? Like just how quickly it's reproducing. I, I forget all the statistics. Um, I know fight the new drug. I'd mentioned them offline. Um, you know, they put together 
a, a lot of really interesting research about, you know, how much there is, so like how much bandwidth it takes to to keep it, how many servers, you know, like it's it's an obscene amount of of content that's out there. Um, and it's getting, you know, more and more, you know, over the line, I guess, if you can say it started on the line originally. Well, the prob- the problem with it is um, I'm an advocate for um, people having sex. People should have sex. People should have good sex regularly with with people who love them and take care of them. And, don't and now them. listeners are taking notes. Now they're right. taking notes. They're like, <laughs> okay, to have sex. Perfect. Have, sex. <laughs> have good sex. Don't have bad sex. Um, but the problem is with pornography is it's preventing people it's, it's, it's keeping people from having sex with other people. Hmm. It's, it's used as this weird saccharine substitute for having this like real human connection. And we know there's like endless amounts of research about the need to be physically touched. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's interesting because the statistics on kids getting pregnant and having under underage sex or underage pregnancy, I don't know, whatever that means, um, is lower than it ever has been mm. because they're watching pornography. No. I'm like, you know, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater, like pregnancy and as a teen, no STDs, no ever, hopefully. Um, yeah, those things aren't great. and We can do things to prevent them. But now people just are choosing pornography. You know, when yeah. pornography is ruining marriages and, and let's just say in an ideal world, if we could have pornography, this is pretty bad when you're wishing for this, but I wish it was like, <laughs> like people having sex and yeah. not like now, can it, can I get a little bit graphic or yeah, that's fine. Am I allowed to win? Yeah, like, no, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I, everybody has their own level of <laughs> what they say. So yeah, you're, you're good to go. I, I don't, I don't okay. worry about it on this show. So. Um, but now it's like every single thing is anal sex, hmm. every single thing. And if you actually interviewed women, like how many people actually truly enjoy that? It's, it's not the 80% that's on showing no. on pornography. I mean, and it's getting more and more brutal. Hmm. Like torture. Some of this stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, just yeah. straight out torture fantasies. Um, and you're not having that intimate connection. No wonder it's getting more and more twisted. Right. Well, I, I think um, this is one thing that I think is important to to recognize and address. And I, and it's one of the reasons I was mentioning the difference between even 2008 or, or early 2000s, or especially, you know, when you talk about, you know, a, a, you know, parents, you know, back in the day or, or, you know, talking about like, oh, we used to smuggle Playboy or something where you're looking yeah. at, you know, an image versus like, you know, Can we bring that back. Can we bring, right, please? Right. Yeah. Wishing for that. But I mean, Have Playboy be like, the, or even Hustler be like the craziest thing. Yeah. But please. it's like go, going from that to, you know, the time period I grew up in was like, there's access from like eight, nine, 10, 11. I think the average age is eight that people it's first consumption. Um, you know, but it, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you're seeing that, but then you're also seeing a much more, you know, it's obviously a fictional version of what sex is. So you're seeing a, you know, when you do come to the point where you're, you know, 18 and having sex or 16 and having sex, depending on, you know, whether you're a teenager or not, you're coming at it with, in being informed by what you watch, which is far from being reality. Um, and I, I want to hit on this specifically. One of the things that I found out about you is that you're a, you're a Christian and you mentioned this in one of your interviews as well. There's this, there's kind of been this default to like ultra puritanical. We don't talk about right. sex. We don't talk about boys and girls. We don't talk about anything. We don't, we barely talk about periods enough to get them like, you know, to that time of the month to be taken care of, but that's it. Like no understanding, um, you know, and then you've got, especially in the, like the culture I grew up in, that's the case. You're not talking about it, but then you're also living in a culture outside of that, that is heavily pornified as, as you say. Right. So 
you've got guys who've got nobody to give real world experience and girls, no real world experience, no understanding, no explanation. And so they're going and filling in gaps with all this information from, you know, Pornhub or, you know, it's their their only place to get it. Right. And so that's, I, I, I think just that, like just looking at that and then looking at how many marriages are struggling with intimacy, you know, a few weeks into being married as a new, you know, Christian couple. I think a lot of that just is from misunderstanding what you're supposed to do. Like what is, right. what is yes. this supposed to look like? Um, right. And and so your, your brand, I mean, has been basically, how do you educate kids, not shelter them, not, not tell them that doesn't exist, but how do we educate them? And, and I guess looking at the the feat of doing that when you have to either choose between seemingly being ultra conservative or ultra liberal with your kids, uh, how do you find that balance and how do you kind of educate your kids um, through this kind of messy uh, uncharted world? Well, first of all, I think people need to understand that um, like sex is a, literally a gift from God. Mm. You know, it's um, denying it, not talking about it, you know, having shame. Uh, you know, I was I was talking to somebody the other day and we kind of got into a discussion about masturbation and he was saying, you know, absolutely no masturbation. It's just, uh, excuse the pun, but it's a slippery slope and blah, blah, blah. And it's connected to pornography. And I'm like, the, dude, that is, that is the least of your worries. I hate to say it, but this is teaching kids that they should not masturbate is shutting down communication. First of all, like saying, yes, you should, or yes, you shouldn't. Um, I don't really even know that needs to be a discussion when kids are little, if they start touching themselves, you say, you can do that. You need to go into your room though. That's what we do. That's for private. You know, don't pick your nose in public. Don't touch your privates in in public, (laughs) you know, that kind of stuff. It's not a big deal. It's no big deal. Um, But I think that a lot of, uh, religious organizations need to understand that in order for marriages to be successful, there's like you were saying, there's, there's real trauma that can happen when you have a completely uneducated couple coming together for the first time, Hmm. you know, and if, if it's been this, like they can't even hold hands. I mean, it can get really extreme in different, um, in, in different groups and people, even if they're not going to be having under underage sex or premarital sex, they still need to understand it yeah. and appreciate it. I mean, it's and also, you know, it's nobody ever uses the word vulva. They always say vagina and stuff like that. And it's, it seems like a simple thing, but it's basic anatomy, right? It's, it's just your body. Yeah. You can do horrible things with your mouth too, you know? Um, So actually ignoring anatomy is a huge, a huge part of it. I talk to Christian groups all the time and people pull me aside and say, I just learned what what a labia was. And these are women in their fifties. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is, it's health too. You know, they're learning about how their bodies work um, when they're having babies. Yeah. There's no, the, the, come on. It's like, it's 2020, 2021, <laughs> 2021. Right. It is Talk not 2020. Labias. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's our episode title. Great. So, but, uh, but no, I, yeah. So, so kind of, kind of diving into that. I mean, one of the, one of the things you do, and I, I don't want to have you talk too much about things you, you cover pretty often, but I think this is really interesting because one of the, I have a three-year-old and, and one of the big conversations is just, you know, yes, you want to educate, but you also don't want to give more information than needed or, you know, or, you know, scare them, you know, like we, we often talk about, you know, like the whole stranger danger stuff or like telling mom and dad, you know, don't keep secrets, that kind of stuff. But like, it's, it's one of those things where you're also don't want to, you know, scare her about like, Oh, what is so-and-so doing? Or why is this person here? And, you know, all that kind of thing, but you have a really good way of talking about, um, you know, kind of predators with your kids and talking about potential danger. Um, can you talk about the zoo trips and kind yes. of explain okay. h- uh, how that works? I think it's a really brilliant way to explain it to really any age group. Okay. So the, I mean, 
you pretty much nailed it. The biggest problem that we run into is how to introduce concepts of safety at a very, very early age without too much information. Like even the stranger danger stuff. I don't know if you've noticed that stuff backfires, Yeah, you know, and well, and it's, it's it's a small piece of the, it's like, I think what 7% or 5% of all cases are with strangers. Most, most cases of abuse are with someone, you know, so yeah, Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. And plus you need to learn how to talk to strangers. So what I do is um, we start with their understanding. We meet them where they're at. And usually I have, there's, there's three different levels with kids um, from like one to seven, they are closer to the earth. I would say, I'm going to get a super hippy dippy with you. Um, And they're into animals. And they understand the natural world a lot better. Then when they get older from like seven to say 12, um, they are into the social element. And then beyond that, it's more of the cyber interest. Mm. That's kind of the trajectory that we're on right now. So with kids, when they're really little, we talk to them about um, stalking, luring, and mimicking. And we do that by talking about animals. So we go to the zoo and we say, look at that, that tiger stalking the other tiger. It's laying low, it's watching, it's making sure it's not seen. Um, and you don't, you don't talk about it much more than that. You just add those vocabulary words in, you know, into your vernacular. Look at the cat stalking that bird, uh, luring. I do this with my daughter all the time. Go get Annie something she really likes and lure her in. She, I can't get her in. Go get something and lure her in. Hmm. Get her to do something she doesn't want to do. You have to get something she wants. Um, and mimicking is camouflage. So any animal that is uh, camouflage, oh, look at it. It's, tr- it's pretending to be something it's not. It's, it's trying to be something it's not so we can get closer to its prey. Then when they get older and they're more in, you know, kind of seven to 12 age, then they're going over to friends' houses and stuff like that. You can introduce the idea of humans being predators too. So we're talking about predators all the way along. This is how predators behave. And people stalk, lure, and mimic. Hmm. They can if they're predatorial. And then when they're in the cyber world and they're online, people can stalk, stalk lure, and mimic. That's hmm. how predators work down down to the most primitive species to what we consider ourselves the most advanced in technology. Those are the methods that are used. There's more, there's more, there's blackmail is another one. Um, that as kids get older, they need to understand how blackmail works because that's something we're dealing with a lot right now as kids sending, being convinced to send nude photos. And then if they don't continue to send new photos, then they're the boys especially with boys, we'll, you know, we'll let your parents know that you're sending gay porn and, you know, just, it just ends up being a really bad, bad situation. Right. Right. Um, what, what are maybe some research just one thing about what are some maybe resources that you think would be helpful to people who are kind of breaking this down or, or do you have this in some kind of written format for people to, to check out? I have a, I have a course called young, okay. wild and safe, and it's on my, uh, on my website. Um, but there's, there's that, there's the predator lesson, and then there's a whole host of other ones that mm-hmm. are very similar to that. And the fact that they go in those three stages sure. and just an idea of, um, you know, there's, there's one where, you know, we, we play this, like, it's like a little tickling game. We get grass and you tickle your nose. I encourage everybody to be outside as much as possible when you're doing this, when you're talking about sex, when you're talking about pornography, when you're talking about all this stuff, go outside and lay in the sun, lay in a hammock and talk about it. It completely changes the energy of all of it. I mean, I'm sitting in a dark room talking about porn. It's got a heavy feeling. It feels dark. It feels scary, right? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, it's the go to the opposite end of that. Um, But I do have one um, lesson in there where we, we tickle each other. You sit down and you just get a piece of grass. It's called a mind of its own. And until somebody, whoever sneezes first loses, Hmm. or, you know, if their eyes blink or their eyes water, or they get goosebumps and it's just introducing this idea. And that's it. That's all you have to do. It's called the mind of its own. Isn't that weird? Our body 
does things without us having control over it. It's got mm. a mind of its own. And if you let them know that, that on a, at a very early age and continue that message, isn't that weird? Our bodies, it breathes, you know, it runs snot, it blinks, our heart beats, you know, autonomic nervous system. And then when they are, when they are exposed to pornography, which it will happen at some point, um, remember, remind them that if their body responded, if there was vaginal wetness or if there was an erection because they were watching it, that that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they're into. Hmm. That makes any sense. There's something called arousal non-concordance where there's, it's a 20% overlap with men and the 50% overlap with women as far as the accuracy of their desire of what's going on. So, and then also if there ever is any sexual abuse. Yeah. That's what I was about to just say. Yeah. Yeah. If there's any, anything does happen, God forbid, then they've got that basic understanding that their body, those responses in their body is separate from who they are. And it wasn't permission for the abuse to happen. And it wasn't their fault that the abuse happened. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they liked it and they wanted it and it's who they are. It's the number one thing that therapists have to work with people years and years later is that piece. Yeah. No, I, I spoke with, uh, her name's Dr. Kelly Palfi. She wrote a book called Men Too, um, and she talks about male sexual abuse. And that's one thing that she, I forget the term that she uses to describe it, but she talks a lot about that. Um, and one of the reasons that men don't report is that, you know, if they did experience like an erection, if they did experience anything that felt good, even though it wasn't, you know, even like she said, yeah. people could literally have a gun to their head and still experience things that are signs of pleasure in a normal situation you know, a lot of times abusers will use that as, you know, well, look, you liked it or look, you, you appreciated what I was doing or look, you enjoyed it. Um, And so I think that's, that's an important thing to go over. And I don't hear a lot of people talk about that stuff. Um, Again, just, just going in the abuse route, I I was watching a a documentary just last night uh, called I am evidence. Um, I'm just throwing out recommendations left and right, but uh, I am evidence is a really solid documentary. Um, but again, watching through that, like, you know, there's just so much around how we perceive, you know, abuse, like how, what we actually classify as, as abuse or, or something that's negative. Um, it's just a really, there's just a lot of really big misunderstanding out in just general culture about how we tackle these topics. You know, it's, I, I hadn't, a- you know, as, as I, I'm constantly learning because things are changing regularly now, but um, I kind of have a little bit of an epiphany on why often there's, you know, a situation of abuse or rape or, you know, um, and they blame themselves. Mm. It's a, it's a really common thing. They blame themselves and they're also blamed. Why were you there at this time? You know, why were you wearing that? You know, yeah. all, all this stuff. There's this like, I wouldn't, you know, they, people hear stories and they're like, oh, I, she could have gotten away and she could have done these things. And there's this blaming. But what that is, I mean, I'm not saying for everybody, but this is my current thought process is we believe that we have power in our fate. And we believe that those things, we, we wouldn't do those things. So we had the power to wear different clothes, to de- be different places, when really a lot of this stuff is happening at random. Mm-hmm. And if a victim believes that they have power to have done something different, they, they can stop it from happening again. They mm-hmm. have to believe that it's their fault, that they did something wrong. Otherwise, How do you even exist in life knowing that it could happen the next day? You're walking from the house to the car. I mean, it really was a random act. It's a coping, it's a coping mechanism, essentially. It's a coping mechanism. And then people, people also saying, well, they should have done this or should have done that. They're protecting their sanity as well, because we live in a world of random crappery, you know, there's crap stuff, crap happens all the time. And it's not because of what you were wearing or what you were doing, you know, it's, it happens. And if you don't have an ability to compartmentalize that as, Oh, I have the ability to do something different or it was because of something they did, or I could do, then that puts it in a space of, it's not going to happen to me. Right. Right. 
Yeah. And, and that's, I, I think that also just goes to how we deal with victims of this stuff as well. You know, like how yeah, do you, exactly. how do you address someone who's experienced it? And I think a lot of times the the question does in, in that document, I just mentioned um, there's a scene with a lawyer defending uh, the alleged rapist and he stands up and, and he, his first question, when he gets to the podium is what were you wearing? And, yeah. you know, she says jeans and a shirt, what kind of shirt, you know what I mean? Like trying to dig into like, what were you doing to cause this? Um, another shocking thing in this, uh, some of the most shocking stuff in it was hearing from police officers and reports saying, you know, why they didn't think someone was credible. Um, but there's a, I forget her name, but one of the experts that spoke said, um, you know, I think it's, it was 70%. Um, I think it was 70% experienced tonic immobility um, while being raped. So like the police would say, oh, well, they didn't fight back. So it's clear that they were okay with what was happening. It's clear it was consensual. 70% of people literally can't move when they're experiencing trauma like that. So right. there, there's yeah. just a lot there on the education side that I think is important. And I think that, you know, your body has a mind of its own is important for so many different facets. It, it, it covers the gamut, but I think especially with abuse, it's important for people to understand that like your body doesn't react normally to trauma. Like that's what trauma right. does. It, it changes those, those things. So I think for parents who are trying to deal with a kid who's coming to them and telling them something for a kid experiencing something, even, even in positive situations, you know, like understanding what is your body and what is actually you, what is, you know, and your body doing something doesn't mean you're in a good situation. You know, it doesn't always negate that, but um, yeah, um, I'm kind of curious from the side of um, your, your podcast is how to raise a maverick or raising mavericks. Mm -hmm. Right. How to raise a maverick. How to raise a maverick. Yeah. I was right the first time. Uh, so how to raise a maverick. You're raising, you know, pretty free spirited, you know, kids and and trying to teach them. I, I am curious kind of because culturally we have shifted. I think culturally at large, there's been a lot of blowback toward the porn industry, toward, you know, the manipulative producers, the contracts I talked at length with um, the uh, fight the new drug people about this. And um, a lot of pushback there, like a lot of stuff about human trafficking has come out. A lot of stuff about coercion has come out. Um, I haven't heard anybody ask you this on any of the platforms that I've, I've listened to your, your interviews. Um, so the, the response to that, you know, from people who would say it's okay, express your body the way you want to has been sites like, you know, only fans and like all of these kind of self-produced kind of channels. Um, and I know you said you're, you're somewhat open uh, in that realm and, and you're, you know, obviously you've got issues with like large corporations profiting. Uh, what's, what's your take on that kind of uh, development and kind of the, the, you know, do it yourself production mode that's happening now? Well, the, the problem that I've run into with only fans um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it hasn't been played out yet. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things you have, um, young girls. I mean, it's a sign. Are, are they there because they want to, or are they there because of economic problems? Okay. Um, again, it's taking your people watching this. It's taking advantage of somebody, hmm. you know, were they sexually abused before and they feel like their body is public property. There's that too. it's pornography is pornography in that regard. Hmm. Um, but we also have issues where we have, um, homes, where it's some of the stuff is being filmed and mm -hmm. children are in the home. Um, and then we have young, young people producing only fans and having their family members because they can find them very easily um, following them. And now mm -hmm. we've got uncle, whoever um, making comments about their niece and watch following their niece, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, it, there's a, there's a price for all of it. You know, they're taking, they're taking more charge, more of a charge, but where does it, where does it go? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the problem um, that I have with it is not only are you devaluing your body, you know, and I also, I can't, I can't speak to the girls who are making it, you know, I don't, um, it's people who are watching it that I have a problem with. Hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. It's, I, it, it, those girls are in a situation where they need to pay the bills and they've right. got no an education. That's not 
worth anything. Um, they've got university loans that are sky high and no jobs. Hmm. You know, we closed, we just closed all the bars down in New Orleans where I'm at. Um, so, you know, what do you do? Yeah. Ever, yeah. What do you do? Hmm. Turn on your camera. Right. So it's take, it's taking advantage of somebody who's in an economic crisis. Right. It's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's pornog- it's pornography. It's straight up pornography. Right. Yeah. I was curious to get your answer on that. Cause that was one of the questions I had for fight the new drug. Cause I knew, um, you know, they had mentioned a lot of like, you know, manipulative stuff, but the, the, the two sides of it seem to be, you know, the, there's the people who are now heralding ethical pornography, mm-hmm. which is an interesting phrase in itself when yeah. you start looking at definitions. Um, but I'm always curious to hear just different perspectives on that and and know where people are coming from that. And, um, you know, for people listening, I think sometimes they're like, you know, okay, it's wrong, it's wrong. But I think, you know, obviously my faith informs certain viewpoints on, on some of that stuff. And it, it's got some pretty clear things. But I also want just for the people who want the data, people who want to look at it and say like, is this objectively like, you know, without any religious affiliation, without any, you know, biblical side, like, is this harmful? Um, And so that's why I was kind of curious what your, what your response was there. So, yeah. Um, At the end of the day, I had this discussion today with somebody else um, and they were, you know, trying to, it was a a situation where somebody was filming fans only, um, at home where there was a child and they were trying to get it to where it was, she, you know, she was talking about taking on the whole of the porn industry. And I was like, you, you can't, you, mm, I mean, yeah. this is, <laughs> that's not good. It's not going to work. And I, I, if, if we could stop all of it, if we could go back in time and, you know, send Hugh Hefner in a different direction, I would in a heartbeat, but that's not where we're at. And, um, it's all for me, it's all about protecting the kids. Right. And that's the, that's the one space where we have a little bit of leverage where yeah. people most of the time will agree. There are some people who think that kids should watch pornography. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, most people say, yes, kids should not watch this. Yeah. And that's the, uh, that's the, the only space I really work with because I can't take on the whole of the porn industry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's like taking on the tobacco lobby or taking on, yeah, there's just some things that are, are way too big, but yeah, you can, you can gate a little bit, you know, you can be a gatekeeper on some of that stuff. And even more importantly, because a lot of people just opt to be just a gatekeeper, you can also explain and and educate as well, which I think is important. Um, I I know we're coming near the end of our time, um, but I'm just curious for someone who's maybe sitting there, a a parent, um, you know, specifically, I would say, who is sitting there and going like, man, we've dropped the ball. We haven't even started, you know, maybe our kid is, you know, three or four, you know, maybe even six, seven, eight, you know, there's somewhere along that line. And they're, they're saying they're going like, crap, we haven't talked about this. We haven't started educating our kids on anything. Uh, we were just waiting till, you know, we had to talk about it. Um, can you maybe give one resource outside of yourself that's that you found helpful, maybe a book or, or something that'd be relevant. And then maybe just tell people where they can find some of your content as well. So like one, one of yours, one of like an outside. Yeah. So one of the best books that I've seen for kids is good pictures, bad pictures by Kristen Jensen. And she has one for really little kids. Uh, it's junior, uh, good pictures, bad pictures. Um, and then she has one that's older and it goes more into, um, addictions and, Mm. um, kind of explains a little bit more in depth with the younger one. It's just basically saying, you know, that there's some pictures that are fun and good. And then there's some pictures that, that, you know, she doesn't say what it is. Um, it's just kind of this introduction. I have a hard problem with the language around it. It's not good. It's not bad. Um, I prefer more of these are private pictures hmm. because kids have a very definitive way of looking at things that if I see this, I'm bad. And, right. you know, ca- you know, people don't watch porn. Kids don't watch porn. They get caught by porn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
it, it catches them. It's, it's not their fault. And every, you know, a lot of people say I'm going on a tangent now, but um, I know people say like, Oh, my kid's a good kid. He would never look it up. And I'm like, you're, you completely, you're doomed. You don't you're already get losing. It. If you're thinking you, that you way, don't, you don't get it. Your kid is not a bad kid. If he looks up porn and also, you know, all oh, my, my son or daughter, they get really weird and squirmish. If we talk about anything to do with sex. And I'm like, of course, because nobody wants to hear about sex, anything from mom and dad. <laughs> of yeah. course. You think they're going to be curious? Yes. Like they're not most likely asexual. No. Wake up. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it is, it's a matter of when um, it's, it's a, you know, I, I was telling my wife, you know, not too long ago. I was like, cause I'm very like strict about like the, you know, the tablet stuff. And like, I, I just get freaked out by it. And I'm just like, th- the first time that I ever saw porn was totally, it was not me searching it out. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I wouldn't have even known to search Either. it out, you know? And, yeah. sa- and same with, same with most of my friends who <laughs> I'm not going to name them or, or out them, but you know, a lot of my friends, same thing. It was like, Oh, we found this or, Oh, and it was, that's going to happen it's, it's like you said, it's not a matter of if it's like, when, and are they prepared to handle it or to talk about it when it happens? Um, so I will give one little tip. That's been a sure. lifesaver for our family is figure out how to put, um, to lock them into an app. Hmm. And this is really good with the younger kids. Um, so I have my iPhone set up to where I, I push the, the home button three times and it locks it. So my daughter can't go into any of the other apps. It's a lifesaver. And then you can also, you can do it on the tablets, whatever. And then you can put a timer on it. Hmm. You know that they're not going to be searching around. YouTube kids is not a good place. PBS kids (laughs) is great for if you want them to just be able to. Yeah. If you want to be able to get a lot slips through on YouTube kids. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But yeah. I can laugh about it because. It hasn't been a problem. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. some of them. Just like, oh my god. Yeah, PBS Kids is our go-to for sure. That's a pretty yeah. awesome section. So, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'll throw out one more recommendation as well. Um, just more on the on the predator side. But God made all of me is a is a mm. really good book. Um, my one of the thing I love about it is it 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 does go into like good touch, bad touch a little bit, but it, it goes into more grooming specifically. So it talks mm-hmm. about, you know, keeping secrets. It talks about, it goes into playing doctor. It goes into, it goes into a lot of just like what's good, what's bad, who's good to keep a secret with, who's bad to keep a secret with, you know, all of that. Um, it's just a really, really good book. Um, and so yeah, I'll just throw that out to the audience as well. Yeah, um, cool. It's a really good recommendation, but uh yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, what's what's the best place for people to find you to connect with your podcast, with you in general? How to raise a maverick.com is probably the best. Um, that's my website. I have the podcast there, and then everything kind of fans from that point. Perfect. And then my podcast can be found everywhere. And my my podcast is a general parenting podcast. And um, we're debating on whether or not to go more specific. I was inspired by your podcast because I'm like super niche and right. um, mine was mine's sneaky because I'm like, nobody's going to come on and listen about sex abuse prevention. But um, so I'd like sneak it in when people are looking for general parenting stuff. Right. Yeah. Coy no. like that. Yeah. You'd be surprised. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be a cool, it would be a cool niche to kind of go into. And I, I mean, it's super helpful. Like I'm always looking, like I said, I'm always looking for stuff for just being a parent myself. It's, it's hard finding resources that are actually this valuable. Is, this is got, this has got to be the hardest time. I mean, granted, you know, we don't have polio. We don't have, I mean, we've got COVID, but you know, it's not affecting the kids and we do have COVID or we don't have COVID, whatever, whatever the COVID situation is. Um, but uh, this whole situation with pornography and the kids and sexting and texting and, and now um, people are locked indoors. So it's amplified right. a little bit. Yeah. More. And for the reports of sexual abuse or children's sexual abuse reports are down 40%, hmm. meaning it's happening. It's just not, nobody's catching them now. Right. right. It's heartbreaking. So well, well, thank you it's so on much. A positive for, note. Yeah, on a positive <laughs> note, right? No, but uh, no, thank you so much for coming on and and for sharing. And you've got a really, really unique story, and I, I think a really helpful, balanced approach to this. So I really appreciate it. 
Cool. Thanks. Anytime. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.